It is good to be with you this morning. Sorry for that short delay. Just trying to get everything set up. Tim, thank you very much for your help this morning. Um, we have a lot of things to go through, but we're going to begin today in our series. Actually, this is week two of our series, Known, where we're going to be talking about um, who Jesus is over the next seven weeks. And so this idea of knowing people and being known is a very, um, it's a very powerful thing, but sometimes it's very difficult. And so um, this past month, I've been getting to know staff a little bit better, actually over the last two or three months. But over the last month, there have been some amazing things that have been going on. For instance, we've been having weddings and funerals, and, and Pastor Tim is it's like almost on call 24-7 at times, and he gets phone calls, and he jumps to, and he's doing funeral services here. He's helping out at, at Brown Brothers, is that correct? And, and we just, I mean, just to know that our community has that kind of access. We've been having overnight events, Operation Reality, and, and Brian and his work with his team to, to pull that. If you were a host home, Thank you so much for opening your house, for sacrificing sleep, for dealing with the smell and the dirty clothes. Um, I, don't, I never discussed this with Brian, but one of the rules I always had was if socks and underwear get left at the home, they're a gift to the home. Keep it because nobody else will claim it. I, it may even have their name in it, and they still, I don't know who that is. That's not my underwear. I don't own that. That's not, what are you always talking about? So it's a free gift. It's one of the benefits of hosting. This last weekend, this current weekend we're in, if you came up to the church before the rain hit, you saw that somebody had vandalized the back parking lot in some of the building. And I think Byron Schwalk was a little bit out of shape this morning. We walked, he drove up on Saturday, and there's this graffiti on the ground. And what it was was our children's ministry had a lock-in, and they got out there with chalk paint and chalk sticks, and they're out there writing, God loves me, God loves you, Shirley's the greatest. And so Shirley was there with some volunteers, and, and she was... Um, you know, uh, keeping kids, not just entertained, but investing in them. We've had work to do on the stage. We've taken old lights that weren't working, and, and Jason and, and Tim have been rewiring those things and rewiring the soundboard, trying to, to make our sound system work as best as it possibly can. And so it's just been going on and on, the volunteer work that's been happening, and some of the things that fall under their job descriptions, stuff with Jaira, and we were having staff meeting this week. And we got interrupted three or four times, people coming in the front door just asking questions about how they can receive help. So your staff has been very busy. And, and I've had a joy of getting to know them, but I, I wonder, of all the things that they do at our church, lead worship and work with our students, work with our children, and work with the sound and video and, 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 and care, but I wonder how well do you really know them? Do you really know who your staff are? And so as we jump in this morning, if you received a worship bulletin you worked in, you got a prize, okay? Because in there, there are seven pictures. So if you want to open up, I want you to take a moment, and I want you to try to figure out, of the staff, who is who? How well do you know your staff? Have you stalked their Facebook page? Have you been after their moms? Have you gone up to the house and had snack and looked at the baby pictures and had the photo album? But who is who on the baby page? We have five men, two women. Be careful with who you think the girl is in the picture. Okay? So those pictures are just to kind of poke at you a little bit. I wonder how well do we really know who we are and who each other are. And I'm going to use staff as that kind of that, that, that stick to poke you with. And so we have these two pictures. So in your mind, do you think you know who this is? I mean, I'm not going to comment on, on the age of the photos because I don't want to bring in embarrassment. I'm not going to try to guess who it is as far as clothing style. My dad showed me a picture once when he was three years old and he was wearing coveralls and Mary Jane's. And I was like, Dad, you're wearing girl shoes. He said, I had all girl cousins. When you get hand-me-downs, you, you get what you get, and you wear it, and you have fun, and you go play games. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to comment on the clothing, but I wonder, have you picked out who these two are? Tim Ramsey. All right. Nice, Tim. You look good there. Almost the same hairstyle. <laughs> and Jason Van Ostal. Sometimes when he realizes the work projects that are ahead and he gets last minute um, information from me, this is what he looks like. Oh, come on, seriously. Okay, our next two pictures. Man, we have like opposite emotions here, right? Like stare you down, don't mess with me, don't grab my toys, pain is coming, and just happy joy. So who are they? Uh, Sonia Foster. Yeah, and how about this one? 
Brian Waterbury. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, and this last one here, we got three pictures across the board. Okay, um, we had to go through some really great efforts to get some of these pictures, but I wonder, do you know who they are? Tim Snell, baby Tim. You look good, brother. Shirley Morgan, and of course it leaves Kevin Britton. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing boots in this picture. You can't see it. Um, and I thought it was very appropriate that my stuff came in and I got to wear boots this morning. But my mom, instead of having the baby shoes bronze, she had my boots up by the picture. I mean, greatness. It was just there. How well do you know the people around you? These are, these are cute kids. If they were in the nursery or if you had them next door to you, you probably would go and pinch chick, cheeks and, and have conversations and hold and, and smell baby head and that kind of stuff. It's just these are the people who serve this church. So I wonder, how well do you know your Savior? How well do you know who Jesus Christ is? How well do we know the people around us? What are some of the questions we ask to get to know each other? Where are you from? How long have you been living here? Have you eaten at Dixie Dog yet? All right? There are some, some essential questions. What do you do for a living? Now, it's been very different here. There's a, almost a very common answer to the what do you do for a living here in Perryton. It has something to do with the energy industry, oil and gas, okay? A few people work with the wind turbines. Some people work in agriculture. In the D.C. area, you couldn't ask that question because your life was on the line. What do you do for a living? Well, I can't tell you or I have to kill you, literally. Okay, well, can you give me a hint? Yeah, I work for the government. That's as much as you can know. So it's hard to get to know people sometimes because they can't tell you some of the essentials. But with Jesus, I wonder, has he revealed himself to us in ways that help us to understand? You have to understand, we're taking this infinite being who is greater than our comprehension, and we're trying to understand him at a level that makes sense to us. And not just for an academic reason, to be able to fill out a sheet, maybe take a test, go online, maybe get a seminary degree or something, but this is about life and death. This is about eternity. How well do I really know my Savior? And so what Jesus did was to take seven simple things. Some were more simple than others. Some are very concrete ideas. Some are abstract things that are, are kind of ideas out there. We have a tough time because they don't really relate to you know, the 21st century. But he did it in such a way for us to be able to grasp with a little bit of depth and understanding who he is as a person. If you have your scriptures, I would invite you to open up and read with me. We're going to be looking at John. The book of John is where the seven I am statements are found. We're going to look at those, I think, pretty much in sequential order based on scripture. But if you have your scriptures, John chapter 6. Now, while you look for that, verses 35 through 39, I'm going to give you some background. In John, the storyline in chapter 6 is, is he had, Jesus has just had the 5,000 people fed. He's sitting there with the disciples, and he looks out, and he sees 5,000 plus. Now, some experts say that it's actually closer to 10 to 15,000 people because they would only count the men, the head of the household, when they did the numbers. So somewhere between 5 and 10, 15,000 people are sitting on the hillside, and Jesus says, we've got to have enough bread to feed all these people. And so they take the five loaves, the two fish. I guess they accepted it. They didn't take it from the little boy. He gave it up freely. And Jesus feeds over 5,000 people. And then they collect 12 baskets full of leftovers. Five loaves and two fish. And so then after this interaction, Jesus kind of has the disciples to cast off the bank. He then walks across the water to meet them. He then goes to the other side of the bank. The people are realizing that Jesus is not there. And they're kind of chasing after him, trying to figure out how do we get more time with this guy because he must be a prophet. And so they catch up with Jesus again, but they realize Jesus didn't catch a boat. There's only one boat, and there were two departures. Jesus was left behind when the first boat left, so how did he get out there? And, they, and again, there's all these signs that they're looking for, trying to figure out who is this Jesus person. And then he has an interaction with them. And he says, you know, guys, you really only chase after me because you want more bread. You like what you got the other day on the mountainside. You want more of that. And they said, well, we, we want to have, we want to be fed, we want to be filled, we want to know, if, are you a prophet? Give us some sign. Our ancestors, way back when, were given bread by God as they walked through the desert. He gave them bread. Will you give us bread to eat? And then in verse 35, Jesus answers that question. And this is what it reads. Jesus said to them, I am 
the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus looks at the people, and they said, hey, you know what, the, uh, in, in Moses' in Moses' time, he, he's giving us some stuff. He, he gave our people bread, and Jesus says, if you really understood what was going on. It wasn't Moses that brought you anything. It was God who brought it to the earth, and he fed you directly. And I am the same thing. I am the bread of life. Now, I'm going to go back to this because I want to highlight this statement. When he says this thing, he's taking something very simple, a loaf of bread, something that was at most dinner tables at that time, and he's connecting it to life and death. And you have to understand when he says that, he's poking at two things. One, there are things that claim to be bread. They claim to fulfill and satisfy. You try to eat in first century times, and, and if you're living in a, in a kind of a rancher society, there's plenty of meat. They got, they got sheep. They got goats. So, so meat probably wasn't really a, 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 an at-need commodity. It was available. But trying to find something that provide carbs... And bread was the one thing that they could take to the table and they would eat the meat and they would fill their stomachs with bread. There were times when meat was not found, then bread was the staple. In the Czech Republic, they talk about the times when the, the Nazis came and took over, then the, the communists came and took over, and they, they formed this idea of vitamin P. But P is the, the letter that begins their word for bread. And they would make anything they could, take whatever they could to form bread so they could survive because the times were so lean. And it was so nutrient-dense. It wasn't like a fluffy, nice bread. It was thick. They, they could take that and hide it, and they could take it to their homes and share it with people, and it would give them life-sustaining property until they could get their hands on, on better nutrition. But, but bread is the thing that connects cultures. And a lot of times you understand the culture by the type of bread they have. We have this demonstration here on, on stage, and, and we have different types of bread here. And we've got rye, pumpernickel, we've got some sourdough, which if you guys remember the first sermon I preached, man, that's one of my favorites. And we've got non bread, which is from the Indian culture. We've got pitas, which is Greek. We've got the king's Hawaiian bread. That's like dessert, right? I don't know if you guys ever had sandwiches with that. That's, that's like cheating at dinner time. It's really good. Chibata rolls, which are artisan made. I'm not really sure what that means, but they're kind of, you know, crusty, put a lot of stuff. Croissants. I don't know if you guys realize this, but uh, fact check me. But I think the person who invented this was actually Muslim. It was a French Muslim baker. And the reason he called it a croissant because it was formed the shape of the moon, which is one of the symbols of the Muslim culture. But very French, Right? Share French this morning. Wheat bread with big grains and seeds on top. And then we have the all-American favorite, white bread. Right? This is not the staple of any meal. It's just the condiment. It has no flavor. You, you can put things on it. It doesn't enhance the flavor. It doesn't take it away. Really, this is just like a napkin that you can digest. <laughs> right? Because you can put things on it. It absorbs some stuff. Keeps your hands from getting dirty. But it's bleached. It's processed. I, and I'm not against processed foods, by the way. I think you've got to process a lot of things to eat them. But it's just white bread. And, and the world looks at our bread, and they're like, what is that? It's like, well, this is what we call bread. You toast it, and you put some butter on it, and all you taste is the butter. You don't taste the bread. And Americans go overseas, and they have something like this, which is, man, you can smell it. It's just pungent. And most Americans don't like this because we've been kind of conditioned to the, to the white bread. But you, you kind of see that the way that the bread is done is, is based on the culture and the grains and the techniques. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread, he's like, I'm bringing this to you to fulfill you. God is giving me to you so that I can fill you up. But here's the crazy part. Sometimes we use this as a decoration. It has no consequence to it. One year for Thanksgiving, um, I think it was in Oklahoma at Balco when my father-in-law was a pastor at Balco Baptist. 
And, and we would travel wherever they were. We would go meet them, and all the kids would get together, and we would do some kind of arts and crafts project. Usually it was some kind of Christmas decoration. And we would make little wooden Christmas you know, ornaments to hang up and you know, whatever. And so we would work all week during Thanksgiving. Well, one particular year, my wife decided, and she's absolutely brilliant, she decided to make a cornucopia. Do I know what that is? A horn of plenty? And so she took this foil horn and she shaped it and she took cr uh, crescent rolls and she's wrapping it around. It was like 50, 75 crescent roll packages and we're just wrapping. I mean, it was a big, huge horn of plenty. And she laid it, baked it, she covered it with egg whites and baked it again. It was all nice and shiny. Then she lacquered it, okay? You don't eat lacquer. And at that point, I realized this, this is not for consumption. This is simply a decoration piece. And we pulled the foil out. We started to, to stick fruits and vegetables in there. And we put it at the center table, and we had Thanksgiving dinner. And I wanted to reach over and grab that cornucopia and break it apart. But I could smell the lacquer still. It was still kind of fresh. And I wonder, how often do we use the bread as a decoration? It has no consequence for us. And Jesus is saying, there are other breads that are out there but they're just kind of decorative breads. Or maybe there are breads that are empty. Then instead of containing wheat, in order to have something that looks like this, that's, that's fluffy and has some air to it, you have to have wheat. Wheat is the grain that has gluten that allows the expansion, and the bread doesn't fall apart, it holds together. Different from this, which usually isn't made with wheat unless you buy whole wheat ones, but there's no leavening agent here. It doesn't have the gluten elasticity to, to grow and expand with the gases. But I wonder, do we, do we treat the bread as if it's something different? There are times when people will make bread and they'll use sawdust. And it's because they like the grains to make something of significance. They don't have enough for their family. So they add things that have no taste but add volume. In Europe, they had to pass a law. You couldn't put those kinds of things in bread because it, was, it would kill you. Sometimes the things we think that are bread or life-giving have no value whatsoever. When the explorers came over to the New World and they came to visit America, they found that in the Northeast, in the Boston area, and, and Virginia really kind of went from the Boston area down almost to the Carolinas. It was a huge land territory, and they landed there, and they started to meet with the Indians, and there was this trade, and they found this abundance of a crop, and it was corn. And they had never seen corn before. And in fact, the term corn is simply an English term meaning something hard, hence an acorn. And so they took this, and they loaded the ships up with this, this corn. They put it on the hull, and they began to travel back to the, to the old world. And as they traveled, they would eat, and they were eating and eating and eating. And the problem is that they were dying of malnutrition with their bellies full. And probably some of you understand why. Because that kind of corn had to have lime put in with it in order for it to process what was inside the kernel, in order to unlock the nutrients. And so they were eating it, but they couldn't digest it. And so their bellies were full but there was no life. We are hungry people. We, like the people in the story, are begging for something to eat. And the problem is, like Brian pointed out last week, there's a lot of things we think qualify for bread. They gain my, my focus and my attention. And it's, it's my job, it's, it's sometimes it's finances. It's the things I think are security, but those things never provide life. And so when Jesus comes in, he says, me, it's me. What you're hungry for, God has given me to you so that you can be fulfilled, truly fulfilled. Now, there's a lot of references to help us understand when Jesus says he is the bread of life, to help us understand what he means. But I want to pick on three things in Scripture. I'm going to scroll through this real quick. First of all, we see that when Jesus says he is life, he is life through deliverance. In Exodus chapter 10, you see verses 1 through 28 is talking about the exodus. And, and they've gone through the plagues, and they get to the last one, the death angel. And God says to Moses, I want you to tell the people to go sacrifice a lamb, and there will be things they do with that lamb. And he says, I also want you to go and, and clean your house so that there's no yeast. In first century, in Old Testament AD times, B.C., okay, we're going to even go further back to the B.C. era, you didn't have active yeast in the package. 
You couldn't go to the store and buy a, a 20 ounce container of yeast and little pellets. Yeast was a natural thing that floated in the air. And for many centuries, they didn't understand how fermentation happened. It was just magical. It was the breath of angels. <laughs> That's what they thought. And so what they would do is, once they had a batter, a loaf, a, a, a ready mix of, of raw batter they had leavened, they would take a portion of it, put it in, in some kind of container, a bag or a sack, and they would carry it around as a starter unit. And then they would pour that into the next batter, and it would cause the yeast to, to share. Now, if you go to San Francisco and you buy sourdough bread, they do something similar. And they claim they have the starter set, this, this baby, whatever it's called, back from the 1800s. And they're still using from that same original batter to make this, this bread. But that's how they were able to make things leaven. And so here they are. And Jesus, God says, I want you to tell them to remove everything from their house that would cause leavening. I want you to remove everything. If they eat anything that has leavening in it, they're going to be kicked out of the, of the, the, the tribe. They're going to lose fellowship. And he was trying to get to them to understand that what's about to happen is going to be something they celebrate forever, that the purity of God's people has to be maintained through life-giving actions. And so they sacrifice, they pour the, put the blood on the doorframe, they make the bread, they tuck their clothes into their belts, they eat like they're getting ready to run. And then, then God frees them from slavery. God frees them from death. And the Passover was then instituted. And the angel passed over, and year after year, they would go back and remember how God had saved them. And when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, he's pointing back, and he says, you shall observe this feast. Exodus chapter 16, verse, uh, verses uh, 17. Hold on, I think I've skipped something here. Nope, there we go. Okay, so here we go. In verse 17, it says, you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this day, I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. I delivered your people. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. And Jesus is saying, this is what I am. You're a captive. You are dying. And I come to fulfill you and to give you life. And that life comes through deliverance. Have you been here? Christian, have you ever remember the time you were caught in slavery? Do you remember the time that you were dead because of your sins? Scripture decide, de describes us in that time that we are rebellious people, children of wrath. Death is what we're about. And then at some point in time, you understood the bread of life. And you understood what deliverance meant. That death was no longer an issue. And slavery was no longer your identity. That you are freed because of who Jesus is. Jesus brings life through deliverance. He also brings life through provision. Now we went back to that first example, right? Old Testament, Exodus, the, the evacuation. Well, then they leave Egypt which is a beautiful story, right? How do we go from Joseph being over all things for, for Pharaoh to all of a sudden there are a million people in captivity in the same country 400 years later? And then God releases them. They walk through the desert and they begin to celebrate and praise his name, right? No. They begin to gripe. <laughs> We're hungry. Let's go back to Egypt. At least they had bread. <laughs> We're hungry. And Moses goes before God and says, what are we supposed to do here? And God says, I'm your provision. I want you to tell them to get up the next morning, and I'm going to provide meat and bread. And what they do is they need to take what they need for that day for their household. And on Saturday, on, I'm sorry, yeah, on Saturday, on the, on the sixth day, they collect enough for two days because the next day is going to be a day of rest. And then they start all over again. And if they take too much, it'll spoil. But there will be enough for them to eat and be filled. And so in, in Exodus chapter 16, he goes through the identity of being pre, uh, provision. But in verses 14 through, through 19, this is what it reads. And when the dew had gone, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost in the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. They were ignorant to God's provision. They had never seen this before. 
And Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whatever, whoever gathered had much, nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And so God was providing. Not just basic essentials, not just to get by. He was filling their bellies with his nourishment. And so this is what the reference is. As Jesus is on the mountain feeding the 5,000, they come back and said, you remember this, Jesus. We want more of this. We want you to feed us more bread. Show us a sign that you are a prophet. And Jesus says, I'm not here to give you that kind of bread. I am bread. Consume me. Make me part of your life. I will bring life, and I will feed you as much as you can possibly eat. I would love to take a, a survey of people here who have read Scripture and have, have, have wrestled with it and, and really dove into it and had conversations about it. Was there a place you ever came to an end of that action? Did you ever get to a place where you're like, well, I've got that summed up. I've got all the ideas understood. I can categorize that in my notes. I'm going to pack it away because I really don't need that information anymore. I have conquered it. That's like a first grader walking in and saying, two plus two, I got it. The rest of the world's going to be easy. And you're sitting there going, oh, geometry, calculus, trig, there's way more. It's almost infinite. And Jesus is saying to them, keep eating. There's still more you can fill yourself with. Because when I give life, I give it through provision. I am here to meet your needs. Jesus' life through deliverance, through provision. Then I'm going to jump forward and give you what Paul used to describe Jesus. Because he talks about life through unity. Do you realize as a human being, you're created for touch? Whatever your love language may be, you were created to have touch. Some people love touch more than others. Some people want to have the touch of maybe one or two people, and they would prefer them to be biologically connected with some purpose, okay? My parents, maybe. My mom, my dad, I don't know about that one. Okay, my kids can hug on me. My husband, uh, let me initiate first before you grab on, but, but you know, maybe we'll do a distance hug, okay? In the church, you have different styles of hug, right? You have the full you know, embrace. And that's usually kind of the man-to-man, -man, woman -to woman Then you have the greeter hug where you kind of stand side by side and you kind of pat on the shoulder. It's nice to see your head's over this way and your feet are kind of pointed out. But we have to have touch. There were babies in Romania in the 90s who never had touch. And they had these situations and conditions where they would just rock themselves to sleep at night because there had to be some semblance of human interaction. And oftentimes they would physically die. We were created to be unified. That's what Jesus prays in chapter 17 of John, that I am in you and you are in me and they are in us. We are unified together. We have to have this. And it's not just that we all kind of under the same logo, right? The two hearts with a cross in it. We don't all wear the same swoosh on our shoes or our pants. Guys, don't ever go to Lulu Row. Let it, let it go. You don't need to go there. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then, then Jesus has saved you from pain. You hear that it's only ladies who are laughing. <laughs> so ask a lady later on. I may have even mispronounced it. I don't know. We don't all have to have the same thing, but there's something that happens with Jesus as the bread that allows us to understand what unity is. And so we find this act of unity in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 through 17. And Paul writes, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is, not, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? He's talking about communion. And the Corinthians were struggling with this. Some people were coming to the communion table and they were eating like it was buffet style. And some of the hungry people in the back who had to go second didn't even get any. They were treating it like it was the smokehouse. They're at, they're at China's super buffet. <laughs> they're not at the communion table of fellowship. 
And Paul is correcting. He says, do you understand that this is the, it's the symbolic body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and, and what we do is about worship. And then he drops this bomb. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of that one bread. When Jesus gives life, he pulls unity into the mix. Because there is one Jesus, one Savior, one Christ, one Messiah. And here's the funny thing. I'll bet you across the panhandle, there are churches that use all these kinds of breads for communion. I guess I need to get an oyster cracker and bring it up here. Because that represents CWC. Some people have flat crackers with stripes on it. Some people have little wafers. Right? We all observe communion in different ways. But guess what? It's Jesus Christ that we're remembering. You may do it every week, you may do it once a month, you may do it once a quarter, you may do it at Christmas or Easter, you may do it once a year. It doesn't matter. Are you observing what Jesus Christ did? That's what unifies us. You may have wooden pews with beautiful red cush seat cushions and a couple of doilies identifying special places that no one else should come. I grew up in a church like that. It wasn't red, it was burnt orange but there were certain pillows that had been crocheted and stitch worked, and that belonged to that person. Some churches have pews that face this way and this way. Some churches use hard metal chairs. Some churches, they don't have a seat. People just come in. <laughs> There's no reason to sit. sit. Let's just get busy with it. If you're sitting, you're too comfortable. There's no place to sit. We got too many people. And then we have the beautiful green cushy chairs that have enough space for people like me to sit and not touch other people, right? I mean, you sit next to me, it's like I get my elbow space. This doesn't matter. This isn't what unifies us. These are the things that separate us. I think one of the coolest stories in Perryton right now is that we have an underground church. You guys understand that? In China, the church, when, when the Cultural Revolution happened, they went underground to, to avoid being persecuted. They went under the radar, and we have that kind of church in Perryton right now. It's called the First United Methodist Church. They are worshiping in their basement this morning. It is the underground church of Perryton, literally. And guess what? When they first began, Miss Joanne, that's where they started, right? In the basement. Those are the things that separate us. What their pastor wears. Pastor Richard at First Baptist does not wear this, and that's okay. I don't want to wear what he wears. I don't wear the, the vestmal robes. I had a, a pastor, a friend of mine who was a pastor in, in the South, he was in Florida, and they used to do weddings in like judges' robes, right? I have to wear a suit. July, in the afternoon, it's 104 degrees. I would take a judge's robe any day of the week. Those differences are the things that separate us. What brings us together is the body of Christ. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He is saying, it is me that life comes through, nothing else. We're going to jump back into this. He's going to use this life thing a couple more times. But I wonder, would you sit here this morning and say, I'm experiencing life because of the unity that I sense. I've got a connection with other believers that is deep. They know things about me that are ammunition for the gun that could, could wipe me out socially but they're praying for me, not destroying me. Take a look really quick around the people around the, the pews in front of you and behind you, pews, chairs. We don't have pews here, sorry. I brought that into this mix. But look around you, literally, turn your heads, look around. Could you list five things about the people in front of you and behind you? Not just five things like, yeah, he's got hair, uh, some skin. Um, he used to have more hair than, than he has now. Um, nice shoes. Could you really name five essential things? If you can't, you, then you might not understand this one thing. How about this? Do you know more bad things about people than you know redeemable things about people? Oh, wow. Okay, hold on. But I know things that they should not be doing, and they're doing them. How do I handle that? That's where you go back to the presence of Christ and say, teach me how to deal with those things. Because if, if I'm not careful, I'll begin to have multiple loaves of bread. I'll work in other things that can provide some kind of life. 
And I wonder this week, do you, do you put a, a pulse on what your life is like and you sense there's life happening because there's some unity going on? E-groups kicked up this week and, and they may not be the end-all be-all, but what's happening in those e-groups is pretty special. And some of you are going, what's an e-group? Then who are you living in community with? How many conversations have you had in here this morning about something consequential. It rained, weather's nice, might be changing to fall. I got a crop I'm about to plant. My car is acting up, my dog just bit me. I didn't really like the Luke Bryan concert that was in town the other day. Those aren't consequential conversations. And if we aren't having those things, then, then, then life is eluding us. We have some indication of life, but it's not going to happen in this, in this place. It's too big. I dominate the conversation in here. If you raise your hand, I'm thinking you're praising Jesus. I'm not going to call on you to give a response. We got, we got a timeline. We got to get on. Lunch is waiting at Dairy Queen. We got to, be, we got to meet the Methodists who are about to get out from the underground. They're about to be released onto the world. All I'm saying is this. Can you identify how Jesus has brought life to you. How you have been delivered from slavery of sin and oppression and death. How he has provided for you in ways you could not explain other than to give Jesus Christ the glory. God did this for me. And are you living in a relationship that begins in, in the core part of your home with your spouse or your family or your children and, and extends out into the community. You've got people that you're living with and they may worship different than you, but they worship the same Jesus Christ. And that essential brings us together. Can you identify how Jesus is the bread of your life? And if you can't, then you're starving. There's a, a great story um, the prophet has, has given a prophecy that there's going to be a, a drought. He's living under the oppression of a king and a, and a woman, a queen, who is just out for blood. And Jezebel's coming after him. And God sends him to the desert. Escape and go to the dry land. And so this, this famine has descended upon the country. It's God's judgment upon this nation. He runs for the desert. And while he's there, God protects him and provides for him. He sends birds that bring bread, and he drinks water out of this little stream that comes out of the rocks. And then the prophet goes over, and he's praying one day, and God says, okay, I want you to move on. Move to a different area because something's about to happen. I need to provide for someone else. It's going to be through you. And so, so the prophet continues to move. And he comes across this woman who's at the stream, and she's gathering water. And he comes over and says, woman, do you have anything that you can give me? I'm hungry. And she says, I have one small thing of oil and I have one small thing of flour and I'm about to make the last loaf of bread for me and my son and then we're going to die. Man, how do you ask for that one? Well, great, can I share that with you then? <laughs> I'm hungry too, can I come have a piece of your... It's probably going to be a little cake loaf like this, flat and tasteless. And God says, tell her if she will make you bread, I will keep providing for her. And the prophet looks and says, if you will bake me a piece of bread, and every time you open the jar of oil, it will be filled. And every time you open the, the container of, of flour, it's going to be filled. And you will have food until things change. God will provide for you until the famine is over. And so she goes home, invites him into the house, and the little boy is sitting there. And I can only imagine, if this was the last meal they were going to have, he is not a thriving kid. He is at risk. And this prophet comes into this table, and they had a loaf of bread, and the woman opens it up, and there's more. And, I, and, and this isn't in Scripture, but it's like a little kid at Christmas. You know, you crack it up, oh, it's still there. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Hey, hey, get another container. She pours it out, and she closes it, and then she opens it. Oh, it's still there. I'm like, this is crazy. And the, and the prophet's like, yeah, I, I told you this. God provides, right? And she's opening the flower, and she's throwing it in the kid's face, and they're making little smiley faces and stuff. Let's make some salt dough and wh Whatever. But God is providing. And it's a beautiful story because what he does to take care of the prophet, the man who's falling in obedience, it overflows into providing for people who are starving and hungry also. That may not even be asking God for, for care. 
but God is so good. Are you giving away bread of life? You're going to be at county courthouse this week. You're going to be out in the field. You're going to be at home. You're going to be at the pharmacy, at the bank, drawing up title papers, pumping gas. And I wonder when you interact with people, what are you giving them? I can't save them. There's no place in Scripture that says Kevin is the bread of life. But what God has given me, it's like the woman who keeps opening the jar and it's still there. Every time I dive in, God just keeps providing. He keeps giving. And the more I want to give away, the more opportunities I see that I can give, he keeps pouring into me. And my prayer is that he would give because as he pours in, it overflows. Knowing that there will be times that he's going to kick the canister over and he's going to pour me out onto the ground and onto whoever's around me. And it's going to be, I'm going to be emptying. And he's going to bring me back to a right place and he's going to continue to fill into me. If I stay in his presence. If I keep eating the bread of life. I'm going to end on this thought. In, in the first century, Christians struggled with their imagery. It's really hard for me to preach. You should be eating Jesus. I mean, how do, how do you say that to someone? That's cannibalism. In the first century, Christians were kind of dealt as a, as a really weird sect of people because they talked about drinking blood and eating flesh. But when we say those things, what we're saying is, I am becoming more like Christ. And as you eat from the bread of life, is it transforming you? Tomorrow, you're going to get up. How will you eat? Back deck, breakfast table. If you're driving, long drive to work, man, go to, go to Amazon, go to Apple Store, download a, a lecture, a sermon, scripture reading, turn on Bible TV, get on your app and turn it on and just read. Did that dude that reads the scriptures in the Bible app? That guy rocks. He, he almost sounds kind of like Grant and Warren. And you can get like, I don't know if you can get in New Zealand or Zimbabwe, Zambian, I don't know, but, but he kind of has this neat little accent. Okay, whatever, whatever gets you going, man, listen to scriptures. Spend a moment, stop and say, okay, God, what does this mean to me? Help me understand. Eat. Feast. And this isn't some, some wimpy Boy Scout camp that you got to wrap your bread around a stick and burn it and say, mm, that tastes good. This is walking in to the banquet hall and eating all that you can eat. It's like going to Fogo to Chow. If you've never been there, they keep bringing these sticks of meat, and they keep cutting it, and they keep saying, you want some more? And every time your card is turned over on green, they keep cutting meat onto your plate. And so for some of us who have control issues, that's like a death card, <laughs> right? But when we eat like that with Jesus, it just gives life over and over and over. We cannot be fulfilled enough. So the final thought is this. Are you hungry or are you starving? Because Jesus said whoever eats will eat as much as they want and will find fulfillment. And so if you're starving, you're eating from the wrong bread. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for, for explaining to us something so simple that we can put our hands on, we can tear apart and Father, we can smell it. I'm up here, I can smell the sourdough mixing with the rye and, and, and mixing with the, the pain. And Father, it's just, it's this incredible thing. And it reminds me there have been times where we, I personally, have substituted life-giving bread for poisonous bread. But there have been times where I thought I was thriving in faith and I turned out to be starving. Because I was eating from somebody else's plate. But Father, the beauty of who you are, you invite us in directly to spend time with Christ and he fills us. And so Father, this morning I pray as we walk out of here that the words, I am the bread of life, would rock us to our core. 
That every time over the next few days I take a piece of bread and I rip it apart, I'm picturing the body of Christ being torn for the purpose of sacrifice so that I could have peace. May it remind me that the tearing of his body wasn't just for me, but it was for the person who's serving me. Father, I pray for Michelle right now. She's serving tables today. I pray that she would find generosity. I pray that every time that I tear a piece of bread and the aroma fills my, no- my nostrils, that, that I'm reminded of what worship truly is. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that, that, Father, it makes its way up to you and it fills your nostrils and you find joy in it. And that's because of Jesus. And so every time I tear that bread, I'm reminded that life was given to me. Life was offered to us. Life has been offered to all people because of Jesus Christ. And he is a bread that brings nutrition and sustenance and fulfillment, power, joy. It really changes us the very core of who we are. And I pray, Father, that more than just holding on to it, as we tear that bread, we would offer it to somebody else. Father, draw us into a conversation. The tearing of the bread, may that be the tension point that we can say to someone, hey, you know, Jesus compared himself to this. And then, Father, you would fill in the blanks. You would give us the words to say. So, Father, thank you for giving your son the bread that gives life. We pray this in his name. I'm going to ask our our prayer team members to come forward. As they come, I I want you to to just wait for a moment. Now go back to that first sermon that I was able to share. We kind of started off this this new season, this idea of of waiting. Now I want you to wait for a moment. And the waiting is, is that idea of what do I do in response to this? When's the last time I was able to sit down and had a really good tear of bread and just enjoyed it? And I'm not meeting at your table today. I'm talking about spending time with Christ. When's the last time that you partook of his body? That you drank the cup of a new covenant? And life just continued to flow through. Life began to just explode inside of you. Purpose and work and ministry and calling and relationships. If you've never had a tear of that bread, then today's your day. You realize that your life has been built on eating sawdust. How about we text up, your life has been built, if you don't know Jesus Christ, on eating dirt. And it fills the stomach, but you can't do anything with it. And you think, man, that's crazy. Who would eat dirt? Come talk to me after the service, and we'll talk about what poverty looks like. And being people who are so poor, you don't have resources. And you eat anything you can get your hands on. And I praise God, I've never had to experience that, but I've heard stories. But from a faith perspective, how often have I dug into the dirt and thought, oh, this is good. And maybe this morning you're realizing you're tired of eating dirt and sawdust and and bread that has no life to it. And I invite you to come, talk to these people here. They will tell you about what true bread, life-giving bread what it is and how to have it. They'll walk you through that process of agreement with Christ, living in peace with God. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize it's been a long time that bread is sitting on the table and it's kind of stale. And praise God, you know what brings bread back to life? Liquid. The blood and the body. So maybe this morning, it's just maybe it's time to say, you know what, it's been a long time since I've had a feast with God, and I want to pray that God would make me hungry for him again. One of the reasons in in, in the early church that they would do a weekly fast was to remind them of the spiritual property to be hungry for Christ. So maybe this morning, you've been on a fast for years, and you want to come back and, and sit back at the table and eat. Come down front and pray. Maybe you've got some pains. Maybe you've got some griefs. Come. And I'll just tell you this. The people here at the front would love to spend time with you this morning. Let's all stand in this next moment, and let's respond to what what God has shown us.
as you're sitting, standing there in your chair this morning, God has been talking, He's been speaking. Don't, don't waste time. Don't argue, don't negotiate, don't make a deal. Just come, respond. Come down to the front. Spend some time in His presence at His altar. Those of you who are in your chairs, spend time with God as you see the prayer requests that come up on the screen. Maybe just take a moment and pray over a specific name. As people have been emailing in this morning with requests, people have been sending in requests, just take a moment and pray over those names, those conditions. Allow God to hear your voice as you pray for someone else. close in prayer together. Father, it is an amazing thing, completely is beyond my understanding, how you can hear and understand the prayers and the concerns of all the people this morning. And then I take the prayers and the concerns and the thoughts of the people here, and I multiply them by all the churches in this city. And I multiply that by all the cities in the state, and all the states in this country, and all the countries in this world. And as people have been gathering over the last hours, as, as time has, as the sun has risen on each area and they've gotten together and they've worshipped. And the Father, in the, in the vast greatness of who you are, you didn't have to divert your attention from one to the other, that you were able to absorb all those things. And so, Father, as we have prayed this morning, as we've had thoughts, as we've wrestled with things, then we know that you're giving your attention to us. I pray that as your Spirit is released to work on us, that it creates obedient children, the Father, who have appreciated and have enjoyed the bread of life. And I pray that if a person this morning has never had that relationship, they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they've never professed Him as your Son, they've never acknowledged that you rose him, raised Him from the dead, the Father, this morning they would make that decision. Continue to let your Spirit speak into their heart and mind as they walk away from this place. And I pray that every time they hear a song, every time they have a conversation, every time they begin to read something, that they're reminded of who you are, that you are pursuing them. 
And I pray that we are able to rejoice as they come to terms and begin to to eat from the, the bread of life. Father, help us as a church to celebrate life. And so thank you this morning for speaking that into us. Thank you for Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to close out with a few things. Prayer team, thank you very much. There's not a whole lot happening as far as new things hit the church, but I would encourage you to get plugged in. Look at the website. Check out the Facebook page. Um, and, and check out what's going on and get plugged in. If there's a place to serve, there's a place to, to join in. If you're looking for a life group, if you go to our webpage and click on e-groups, there are e-groups there, and, and you can click on one of the email addresses and find out when they meet, what they're doing, and, and I would say get connected. Find a way to start living this life with other people. That unity factor is important for us. Um, it has been good to worship today. Uh, Miss Shirley is out here with the kids. If you see her, just give her a gentle pat on the back and say thank you. She might tip over. I don't know if she's actually recovered from being up all night. I think she said she went to bed at 4 in the morning, maybe slept for like an hour. And then she gave pixie kick sticks to these kids as they left. I never understood the short ter- term sugar stick until I saw a, a three-foot pixie stick. So pray for the parents as they recover also. Things are happening here at, at CWC. And so we want you to get involved in, in what's happening and be a part of life here. Um, I think that is all we have. If you're looking for information, we have ongoing disaster relief. One of the things I didn't talk about this morning was the work that our, our school district has done to collect supplies and take those down to South Texas. I think it's the Brazos ISD. Um, one of our own people, Dimitri Garcia, principal at the junior high, actually was part of that work that went down. The principal at the high school was part of it also. And I'm anxious to hear his story of what he saw when he was down there. Families who've been completely just upheavaled. They have lost everything and they're trying to find a way to have something to get back into normal and the school system is responding really well to that need and partnering. So keep an eye on that. If there's ways you want to continue to give, there's still recovery efforts that are going on, uh, check out those things on our, our webpage and on our Facebook page. It's been a good day to worship with you. I pray that you have bread today that reminds you of Jesus as the bread of life. Be blessed as you go into the community this week. Enjoy your Sunday.